So we'll be going live in about a minute now, less than a minute. Okay. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I've sent you the email. Uh, with yes, I got it. I've got it. I've got it. Namaskar and a very warm welcome to our week 75 Know Your Species, Know Your Zoo talk. This talk is being organized by the Central Zoo Authority, New Delhi, as part of the ongoing Azadi Kamrit Mahotsav. The Mahotsav, which is a 75 week so long celebration to commemorate 75 years of India's independence, is in its concluding week this, uh, this current week. And we are, uh, this is our last talk in the talk series that we have on Know Your Species, Know Your Zoo. So we, the species in focus for this uh, for this week is the Great Indian Bustard, and the zoo in focus is the National Zoological Park, New Delhi. So joined in today to speak to us on the species in focus is Dr. Sutirtha Datta, who is the scientist at the Wildlife Institute of India. So Dr. Sutirtha is, is an ecologist and has done his master's in forestry from the Forest Research Institute and has extensively studied bustards for his doctorate and postdoctorate research. His interests lie in population ecology, behavior, and the conservation applications in multiple use landscapes. His current work focuses on spatial prioritization, risk characterization, and conservation management with endangered bustards as the study model. He is also the co-lead for the Great Indian Bustard Recovery Program in Rajasthan. So over to you, sir, to please uh, speak more on the species in focus for this week. Thank you, Arundhuti. Hello, viewers. Uh, I hope I'm audible enough. Yes. Thank you, Arundhati, uh, for this uh, introduction and uh, lovely introduction. And I hope my uh, you can view my screen now. Yes, it's visible, sir. You can go ahead. Okay. Uh, Namaskar viewers, I'm Dr. Shutir Thadatta. I'm a scientist at the Wildlife Institute of India. And me and my uh, team works on the Great Indian Bustard Conservation uh, with large amounts of our efforts concentrated in Rajasthan, but also in other rain states. I'll begin with a story uh, that we experienced back in the summer of 2020. While our field teams were conducting regular surveys for the Great Indian Bustard and nest searches, uh, we found a rare incident. We saw a mighty Bonnelli's eagle predate a female great Indian bustard that was incubating on an egg. Our team was on the spot and they found the, found the egg amidst the scattered feathers in that area. We collected the egg, we brought it to the conservation breeding center that we had just established. And from those, from that egg, after incubation, uh, we hatched a chick and we named him Leo, uh, a bird that carries the soul of the lion and to commemorate the successful story of the Asiatic lion that had also dropped down to a very few numbers and had again rose back just like Leo and like the Phoenix. Great Indian Bustards, uh, Leo's fellow mates, the Great Indian Bustard is a very interesting bird. It is a ground dwelling species. It lives in open habitats. Uh, it prefers grasslands and it avoids densely wooded areas and areas that are intensively cultivated, although they can inhabit areas which have some agriculture uh, as a mosaic uh, with grasslands. Once the, once the landscapes are entirely cultivated, they generally tend to abandon these areas. They need a mosaic of short and tall grasses. Short grasses are preferred by these uh, male uh, bustards that tend to use them for displaying, whereas the tall grasses are used by chick rearing females for concealment and for food. They are omnivorous in their diet. They depend on insects, small vertebrates, plant matter, and crops, and they require very high insect abundance, particularly during the chick rearing uh, period, as these uh, as these chicks depend upon that protein-rich food matter for growth. They are a very shy species and they avoid disturbances. What attracts great Indian bustards to many wildlife enthu enthusiasts, uh, photographers, wildlife photographers, and the general people are its iconic displays, iconic mating rituals. You can see on the top right panel, a large great Indian bustard male, which is almost twice the size of its female. They tend to display to attract the females from these elevated areas, uh, which are called arenas. And the females, they choose from multiple males, which is the most attractive. And the females take the sole responsibility of rearing the uh, chick. 
Now they are they have a very slow reproductive rate. They lay a single egg uh, most of the time on the ground. And because they are open nesters, they lay eggs on the ground. They have the eggs have a very high chance of uh, being predated. So we have seen about 70% of eggs just failing because of predation. And subsequent to that, the chicks that hatch also have a high mortality because of the uh, the low resources in these very arid landscapes, the desert kind of landscapes that they inhabit. This bird is typical uh, dweller of the arid landscapes of Rajasthan, Gujarat, and so on, where resources are, are less and the reproduction of these species is largely dependent on the rainfall. Uh, now, the Great Indian Bustard has been in peril for a very long time. Uh, back in 1970s, their numbers have dwindled to about 1260 individuals and subsequently over the last 50 years they have been on constant decline and currently they are critically endangered with just about 100 to 150 individuals left in the whole world and largely restricted to India that too in a single population which is in Jaisalmer which contributes to 90 percent of the global population as per our estimate in 2018 there are about 128 individuals over there while the rest of the population are found in very fragmented pockets in Gujarat, Maharashtra, and Karnataka, and uh, Bellari, uh, each with about five individuals, and most of them without a male, and therefore with very poor chances of breeding success. Now, how did the Great Indian Bustard, such an iconic species, reach these catastrophic levels? And the reasons are in part in the various causes that have, uh, that have uh, threats that have resulted in their decline. The species has uh, been stabbed uh, by a hundred different causes, and uh, some of them are more critical than the others. Direct threats such as historical hunting and uh, some poaching in the Indian-Pakistan border, along with the current very high fatal collisions with power lines because of their poor frontal vision, uh, are the major causes of their decline. Uh, along with that, their habitats have been lost lost to intensive agricultural expansion as these open grassland habitats have been taken over by agriculture uh, in the past and currently with the renewable energy generation such as solar power and wind power that have come into their landscapes much of these habitats have gone from the holes of the great indian bustard along with that some ill-informed strategies such as plantations of trees such as prosopis juliflora has also encroached in their habitat now the, the, while this bird, they represent these large arid landscapes, these landscapes are regarded as wastelands in the government policies. And this has resulted in a lot of diversion of these uh, habitats which the species depend on to other kind of land uses. Now, vis-a-vis -vis these various threats that have affected the species, there is something very unique about the, uh, about the biology of the species that make them further vulnerable to extinction. And it is, uh, it is because of their very slow life history. They, their reproductive rate, their reproductive potential is very low. And uh, a single individual, a single female lays one egg uh, in a particular season. If the egg gets predated, then they can lay up to four or five times as per new research uh, using telemetry that, have, uh, that uh, we have generated. But once these, uh, the, the chick hatches successfully, then they don't breed up to a year. So they can raise up to one chick at max in a year. Now, those chicks have a very high probability of uh, mortality in the initial uh, uh, few months, but once they have survived that initial three, four months, after that, they have a much larger, uh, longer lifespan and very high adult survival. Now, if by any way, the adults are taken off the population because of hunting, because of fatal collisions with power lines, for any other reason, then the population decline is inevitable, as you can see in the graph to the right. Therefore, threats that are that uh, that target the adults of these birds have caused a serious decline in their numbers. Now, how can we save the great Indian bustard? As we see, saw, so, they have a very high juvenile mortality and currently because of past hunting and current power line related mortalities the adult survival rate is also very low so biologists think that the way to revive their population would be in two ways one to improve their reproduction and that can be done by securing their breeding habitats and secondly by reducing the adult mortality by bringing down the adult mortality through protection and by mitigating threats to the adult birds and for that, 
the following measures are required. Number one is to create breeding enclosures and manage predator population within the, them so that the reproductive success can be improved. And this has already been implemented in Rajasthan and other busted range states uh, with particular success in uh, Rajasthan. You can see over here, this is a large fenced area. And you can see to the right of this fence is lush green uh, grasslands, which is because of the vegetation recovery that has happened after these enclosures have been uh, have been uh, created so that over grazing by livestock have been kept at par at, at bay uh, the other side of these fence you can see how contrasting and overly grazed they are these vegetation recovery they benefit insect population and they benefit the chicks and the chick rearing females and increases the recruitment rate of the species we have been seeing Majority of the nesting uh, attempts done within these enclosures, almost 80-90% of the nests are found within such enclosures and uh, there is a higher probability of uh, survival of chicks within these areas. Secondly, once uh, the, the, these species have a very large wide ranging uh, behavior, they, they move over very large landscapes to cope with the uh, uh, with the with the erratic rainfall and erratic resources uh, that vary over space and because of that vast movements they come across uh, hostile threats such as power line other infrastructure and so on which results in their mortality now this issue has been flagged for quite some time and it has been recommended that high risk lines be undergrounded and low risk lines be marked with uh, bird flight diverters, which are devices that make the uh, make the power line conspicuous, so that such collisions are avoided. These collisions basically happen because the bustards they have optimized their uh, vision, or their sideways vision, to avoid predation at a cost of uh, frontal vision. Their frontal vision is very narrow. Typically, they see within 20 degrees around their eye, and when they're flying, looking for uh, resources below, they cannot see the infrastructure such as power lines that are ahead of them and they collide. So by taking a strategic measure of undergrounding some lines and marking other lines with bird flight diverters, these uh, these mortality uh, to the uh, uh, with these cause can be greatly addressed. Now these efforts will be required and many others will be required to create safe habitats, but the species is running out of time and therefore uh, it was it was decided that a conservation breeding program should be opted for to buy time and as an insurance mechanism so that birds can be bred in captivity and rewild, rewilded into these restored habitats once these habitats are uh, created. Uh, with this vision, the National Busted Recovery Program was implemented back in 2013. Uh, it was mooted for a very long time that we require an integrated conservation program which has habitat restoration but also conservation breeding as a component of it. But it took way longer than uh, it was thought. In 2014, there was a national workshop on, on whether conservation breeding should be done for the species and it was uh, agreed uh, immovocally inside the, uh, uh, in the, in the country to opt for this program. However, there were concerns about how this conservation breeding program would affect the wild population and various other things and that delayed the whole process. However, in 2018, uh, there was a agreement that was signed between the Ministry of Environment and Forest Climate Change, Rajasthan government, which is currently the main custodian of the wild busted population and the Wildlife Institute of India as a technical uh, partner to initiate this program. And since 2019, we have been able to uh, commence conservation breeding of Great Indian Bustard and also Lesser Florican. Now, where do we stand now? Much of these conservation efforts that I will be discussing now uh, are uh, concentrated in, uh, in the Thar landscape, in the Great Indian Thar Desert, which is largely in Jaisalmer and adjoining districts of Rajasthan. If you see this landscape uh, in the lower panel, these are large, very vast, uh, desert and grassland kind of habitats which were erstwhile used by livestock herders uh, for their livelihoods and currently there is a lot of renewable energy that have come into these uh, landscapes uh, within these areas there are uh, there are grasslands and uh, largely which are protected by forest department as enclosures but also much beyond that as well map over to the left panel you can see where the great indian buster distribution
uh, gray locations are the current buster distribution. About 90% of the global population is found over here and they're restricted in two pockets. One in Desert National Park to the left. This blue area is the Desert National Park. So there are a large, uh, there is a significant population that is concentrated in and around this area. Another population is found eastwards in the Pokhran field firing range, which is under Indian Army control and are used for artillery testing. But they are also in violet areas and therefore preferred by the species because they are very shy, avoid disturbances and therefore prefer these kind of inviolate areas. Now, majority of the of our conservation efforts uh, have have been concentrated in this area because of the sheer number of gods that are found over there compared to anywhere else in the range currently. Our, uh, the national conservation breeding, the national busted recovery program uh, relies uh, on, uh, on a central uh, component, uh, which is conservation breeding. And it was conceptualized uh, to uh, act as an insurance against extinction and to buy time for habitat restoration so that birds can be bred in captivity and rewilded in, uh, in restored habitats. And uh, this, we, we started this in 2019 with a pilot facility in some, which is uh, close to uh, Jaisalmer, uh, about 50 kilometers west of Jaisalmer near Desert National Park. You can see this facility over here. Uh, it has bird holding areas, the incubation and chick rearing facility and in-house uh, production of food that are required for these birds. Uh, subsequently, a larger conservation breeding facility has been uh, also developed in Ramdevara, which is also in Jaisalmer. It covers about two square kilometer area. And the image below is from uh, that facility, which has also been operationalized now. So we are establishing a founder captive stock for captive breeding and rewilding. And we currently have 16 more than one year uh, birds over here and uh, six uh, which are less than one year. Now, how do we how do we how does the whole process of conservation breeding work uh, let me go uh, take you through glimpses of various approaches various activities that we take uh, to implement this uh, activity it starts with searching of nests when the female great indian bustard lays an egg it performs a very uh, peculiar behavior where it keeps coming back to a central location where the egg is our field teams who are now experienced in spotting uh, the females and understanding from their behavior whether they are nesting or not, they position themselves in these vantages, which are elevated areas across this large landscape, and they keep watching uh, and spotting females and trying to identify whether they are nesting or not through the spotting scopes and binoculars. These are very remote and non-intervening, non-intrusive way of finding uh, incubating nesting females. Once a, a nest is detected, we approach it and we collect the egg in a insulated box, shockproof, thermally insulated box, like in, you can see over here. Then the egg is collected, carried from the wild across several kilometers, sometimes up to hundreds of kilometers, and brought to this conservation breeding facility in some, where it is incubated in these machines, which are called artificial incubators. Here, they, they basically mimic what a wild female does. It produces heat, it regulates humidity, and we monitor the eggs and try to uh, uh, steer them through the appropriate development process. An egg hatches within 20 to 23 days. You can see an egg hatching over here. And subsequent to that, these are the various stages of the, uh, of the, uh, of the chicks development. And we hand rear these chicks to uh, and feed them and imprint them and rear them to uh, make the captive population, captive founder population, which we currently have. These are glimpses of different uh, stages of these uh, of the conservation breeding uh, program and the uh, stock. In the initial few days, about a month's time, the chicks are kept in these air conditioned room, which are uh, disinfected and uh, they are kept in these transparent boxes and they are hand reared and hand fed and imprinted on uh, us. They consider us the keepers as their mothers. Uh, through this gradual process of hand rearing, we uh, these birds develop and they become adults. Uh, 
this conservation breeding is not only a way to secure a population, but it is a great opportunity for us to learn about the species. So they are measured. There are uh, various parameters, uh, blood and uh, physiological parameters are monitored. And we, these are used to steer the uh, both the birds to a proper development so that they can breed in future and also helps us in understanding about the biology of the species in a better way. These birds are reared on a variety of food, uh, balanced pellets, which are procured from outside, and also on invertebrates, mice, and vegetables, which are produced inside so that they can be produced in a very organic and safe way that are safe for the birds to consume. This is a very novel approach that has happened for the species after a very long time and after a great effort, and it required uh, collaboration of multiple people and multiple institutions which who performed a great uh, a, a very valuable role in different stages of getting this uh, getting this program um, off uh, on its wings uh, these these people are dr yp Chala, who are the lead who is the lead of this program the chief file warden of rajasthan the additional director general wildlife of um, of mofcc uh, directors of wildlife Institute of india the dfo the park dfo and the team members who have been trained in this very specialized activity and perform them uh, day in day out 24 7 uh, who are the keepers of the bird and the support staff uh, with us are the international fund for hubara conservation who have been the technical partner and one of the strong pillars of this program and uh, they are they are the uh, very successful breeders of Hubara Buster, another similar close related species which is found in Arab, which is hunted uh, for falconry, but it has resulted in a development of conservation breeding approach, uh, which is currently uh, uh, owned by the International Fund for Hubara Conservation, and they are partners in this program and have been helping us in developing the approach uh, for, uh, for the species. Now, vis a vis conservation breeding, uh, conservation breeding is just a way of securing a captive population which can be rewilded in the wild but the habitats in the wild have also to be restored and for this another component of the current conservation efforts is research informed conservation and we rely a lot on surveys research primarily uh, and, and and a very important component of it is telemetry telemetry is uh, we we deploy tags on, on these birds. You can see uh, a tagged bird over here. And these tags help us monitor the birds over a very, over many years. Some of our tagged birds have survived for uh, four or five years. And they have been giving very, providing very, very valuable information on the habitat use, movements, and demography of the species and their conservation requirements. We are able to understand uh, the priority of threats and how they can be mitigated, where they can be mitigated, and how they can be managed. One important uh, information that our tag birds have shown is that once uh, these uh, many of these tag birds have uh, have laid and we have collected their eggs, and once the eggs are collected, they relay. They relay eggs up to four to five times in a season, which basically means that within the same season, we are having chicks from these birds in captive breeding center, in conservation breeding center, and at the same time in the wild, and therefore uh, doubling the recruitment and the securing of eggs from the captive birds have not been detrimental uh, to the wild population as it was actualized earlier. Let me show you, uh, for example, this bird that you can see, it, uh, it is a tag bird and you can see a chick right behind it. And in the same season, we had eggs uh, from these bird collected in the conservation breeding center and hatched. Now, uh, just to give you a glimpse of how these transmitters work, you see in this, uh, video over here uh, each color is a different bird and you can see real uh, nearly real time uh, we can do real time monitoring of how these birds are moving you can see that many of them are very concentrated in these areas uh, these dark patches these are the enclosures that i was talking about which rajasthan forest department has installed to secure habitats and uh, the vegetation inside these enclosures are very productive they have recovered well and these are the areas which the birds prefer to use during, particularly during the breeding season. In the non-breeding season, they start moving out of these enclosures into a much larger areas because the food becomes more scanty during that time. And then they start moving uh, over very large distances. Uh, you will appreciate how large these birds, uh, uh, birds uh, can range by looking at this table. In some of these areas which are very productive, 
there the bird ranges between 100 to 300 square kilometer a single bird can use up to 100 to 300 square kilometer area they need such areas uh, if these areas are very productive that means if these areas have good vegetation and good insect resources and so on but if they are not so productive then they can range up to thousands of square kilometer an individual bird can range up to thousand square kilometer and such large areas are required for conserving them uh, thus these Transmitters have helped us to understand the space and habitat use of the species. They have helped us in understanding the biology of the species, how frequently they reproduce, what are the causes of their mortality. For example, we found two out of 10 tag birds to be colliding with power lines and dying. We could identify the causes of mortality and prioritize threats using them. We could also figure out which are the areas where the, uh, where, the, uh, where the birds are moving frequently and we could identify the infrastructure that are there, which we have uh, prioritized for mitigation. For example, over here, you can see a bird moving and these red lines are transmission lines in its path. So uh, over the uh, over the entire Thar landscape, which uh, is used by the species, there are close to about 2000 kilometer of lines out of which only 250 kilometer have been identified by us for uh, and recommended for undergrounding using these kind of information. Now, what is the future of uh, the Great Indian Bustard? Uh, although this national buster recovery program have uh, given some hope uh, for the species, but it's a very uh, initial stage of a very long uh, and challenging road. We envisage that this program would require about 15 to 20 years more to be able to breed the birds in uh, captivity and then rewild in the uh, in, uh, in restored habitats. But the most critical aspect is uh, that still remains to be addressed su uh, successfully and effectively is basically to have restored habitats across the species range and for that we require to have about 200 to 500 square kilometer of habitat patches that are free of detrimental infrastructure and intensive land uses across the species ranges such areas can be created more easily in rajasthan because of the vast lands that are currently present here and uh, will be uh, a bit more difficult in the other parts of the range now, to that end, uh, we have delineated the conservation areas, areas that are important for the species that can be safeguarded at this stage. And you can see in these maps, these, uh, these areas are basically the priority areas that have been identified in Rajasthan, Gujarat, and Gujarat, uh, which, are, which are still good habitats for the species and should therefore be protected at this stage. Now, the key actions that are required to restore these habitats are one, mitigating power lines by disallowing new lines and burying uh, very high risk lines or marking them with bird flight diverters in uh, sort of semi-critical areas. Secondly, to safeguard the breeding enclosures by enclosing them in with predator proof fence, managing predators within uh, that because now with humans, a lot of dogs and pigs and other new uh, uh, predators have, have uh, started coming in. Novel predators have started coming in and increasing the respiration rate of the species and they need to be managed. And thirdly, to intensify, uh, incentivize GIB friendly land uses outside these uh, core breeding areas by uh, engaging with local people and having community fodder farms which are useful for livestock uh, so that they don't have to, uh, we, can, we can reduce the overgrazing in key uh, breeding areas and to promote organic farming, long fallow periods that the birds can use and so on. Now the future of this species will entirely rely on these two activities going and tandem hand in hand, one sustained conservation breeding for at least 15 to 20 years and sustained habitat restoration by these activities uh, so, that, uh, so that areas in the habitats in the wild are sort of uh, restored. Now, uh, I would like to thank uh, my team members, uh, the Rajasthan Forest Department, uh, Ministry of Environment, Forest Climate Change, other range state departments uh, for this uh, for the great collaboration and collaborative efforts that is currently going on, which has given some hope uh, for the species. These are some of the pictures of our various activities that we undertake in this uh, in the current uh, conservation efforts. And if you wish to know more about the uh, species and the efforts that we are doing, you can please visit our website that is given over here. Finally, I would like to thank CZA and its partners who have organized this event and given us the opportunity to talk about this species, bring it to the uh, for of the people and about its conservation efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Siddhartha, for the very insightful presentation on the conservation initiatives being done for the 
for the protection of the great Indian bustard. We will take question answers for your session towards the end. We now move on to the second part of today's talk, which is on Know Your Zoo. So the zoo in focus for this week is the National Zoological Park, also known as the Delhi Zoo. So we have it joined with us Mr. Dharam Rai, who is the director of the National Zoological Park. So Mr. Rai is an Indian Forest Service officer of the 2006 batch from the West Bengal cadre, and he has worked under different capacities with the West Bengal Forest Department before joining as the director of the National Zoological Park this year. He also additionally holds the charge as the Deputy Inspector General of Forests in the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. And he will speak to us today more on the zoo. So, sir, I'll go ahead and share your presentation for you. Thank you. So, please confirm if it's visible. Yeah, to me it's visible. Great. Okay. So, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Welcome everybody. Uh, as you know, Delhi Zoo or National Zoological Park, this is the only zoo, one and only zoo that is directly under the control of MOEF. Other zoos, they belong to state governments, they have their own authorities, but this is the only zoo which is directly controlled by the ministry. So, as you know, there are different components to a zoo. So I will be very briefly touching those components and then we will discuss what are our future plans and what we are planning to do in the zoo. Uh, we can go to next slide. Okay, so this zoo is almost, uh, we can say more than 60 year old zoo. It's spreading over an area of 200 plus acre, which at present a bit less area due to other developmental schemes and other works going on. And when zoo was designed actually, so just to have better interface with the animal, there is no hindrance between the visitor and sighting of the animal. So the concept was entire enclosures, they were prepared on a moated, moated basis. Means there were moats to prevent the movement of animal. Initially, we had huge number of species and animals but at present uh, we have reduced it. Uh, we can go to next slide. At present we have around 92 species and around 1100 uh, total animals of different species. And our present area is around 188 acres. Next please. So what do we do and what kind of animals do we have? So, as you all know, whatever the animals we get from outside, generally we have to keep them separate for a particular period of time, that is our uh, quarantine period. Then uh, we have uh, our main animal connection, which we display every day so that visitors can see and get educated about their behavior and how they look and other things. And uh, likewise, we keep on uh, doing other uh, things also like animal transfer, conservation, breeding, and you know, we have, since uh, Delhi Zoo, it is having a good amount of trees, different varieties of uh, flora. So it also harbors many free living animals. Like you can found good number of lizards, peacocks, and other birds, wire-tailed swallows are there. So it acts as the green lungs of Delhi also. And since vegetation is good, so automatically different types of mammals, birds, insects, and other species, they are there naturally. Next, please. So how do we work? We have different sections to which we say ki we are having these verticals. And these verticals, they specialize in a particular work, taking care all the works of the zoo, like veterinary section we have. They deal with the good health of the animals. We have research sections who do research related to the behavior and other disease, etc. of the animals. We have education section who continuously keep on educating and making people aware about the animals, their role in environment. Especially they are the section who continuously be in touch with the students. We have commissary, we have horticulture sections so that when you enter, you have a good look of flowering plants and other 
well trimmed uh, grasses we have security section to just help the people so that there is no commotion and uh, there is a safe distance between the visitors and uh, animals we have sanitary section the importance of sanitary section you all know in general conditions in general situation also the cleanliness is of utmost importance but after covid the importance we all know so every day they keep on sanitizing the entire area so that next day when visitors come all the railings and all the places which are possible ki they can touch so those places they are again sanitized we have maintenance section generally in jo we have a separate wing from the ministry who do the major construction works but maintenance section they are the people who respond to emergency maintenance works if some grill is broken some fence is breached so they help in repairing that and we have administrative section where our office sits and uh, we do all the official work from that place so these are the 10 verticals next please so i told you ki these are the different verticals and under these verticals we have different people who perform their work here we are going to discuss only the, how we are dealing with the works related to animal so at the very front we have zoo keepers as in field we have forest guards who deal directly with the animals and plants in zoos we have zoo keepers they observe the animals they take care of cleaning feeding etc of the animals and whatever their observations are how animal was resting walking to feed etc they keep on entering into their diary if there is some problem in that enclosure they enter the same in maintenance register so that the same can be communicated to the maintenance section and maintenance can be done zoo keepers they are controlled and monitored and guided by the head keepers head keepers they report to the zoo ranger so zoo rangers basically they should and they take a visit of their entire area of all the enclosures and they check these diaries and registers and they communicate to maintenance section and other sections okay in a particular beat in a particular animal enclosure we need to do these works likewise we have biologist whose primary work is to observe to study see the behavioral aspect of the animal and in case there is any issue so correlated the same with whether what is the region of a different behavior whether it is natural to the animal or there is some uh, problem due to temperature due to water problem or there is some health issue so there we involve our doctors also so if the issue is normal then without the medical intervention and if there is a need of medical intervention then it may be a treatment issue supplements issue or enrichment issues so accordingly these things are taken veterinarians they also do the regular vaccinations of animal and in case of death of animal post mortem is also done as mandated by the guidelines next please okay so mainly you know the main purpose or the main goals of the zoo they remain conservation recreation and education so basically we can, we are doing conservation breeding of certain species which we will discuss later on we educate and we target for that especially younger generations and we are doing research recreation also means just by seeing the animal you can see the happiness in the on the face of kids and uh, visitors so in that sense we are doing recreation also next please so these are our uh, target animals where we are involved in conservation breeding we do the conservation breeding for the tiger rhino shanghai deer asiatic lion and red jungle fowl see we have done good work in shanghai deer we have got a good number of population and we have contributed the animals to other zoos also in other uh, any uh, conservation breeding of other animals Uh, we have to work more and i'm very hopeful ki very soon we will be contributing in a better way next please 
so how, how do we help how do we help in raising awareness in spreading education and other things so generally we keep on doing different workshops webinars competitions especially when we celebrate different days so we involve children we involve school kids so there is a competition among them like painting writing know your animals you speak about the animals and those things and we try to share all these activities over social media so that those people who are not able to come here they can also be benefited so like by awareness campaigning cleanliness drives we involve our keepers also who directly talk to the visitors and uh, like by expert dog training etc we keep on doing so that our one aim that is the conservation education can be done next one please so likewise as i told you ki in zoo observation of animal is very important and you have to make arrangements so that animal is comfortable in different seasons so in winter summer and rainy season we do some changes in their diet we provide uh, accordingly so that they can adjust with the natural changes like in summers providing them coolers air conditioners huge cubes of ice enough amount of water for drinking and taking bath and bathing and other things so likewise we keep on doing seasonal changes and enrichments next one please then there is a section where uh, this uh, education section and research section they jointly suggest what should be the enrichment and with the help of maintenance section with the help of keepers we try to use local materials to build different enrichment things which uh, animals they can use for their activity the main aim is that and the uh, enclosure should not be monotonous it should not be uh, where the animal uh, do some stereotypic behavior so likewise we arrange these things and the one thing is ki whatever the best quality enrichment you do it becomes obsolete after few uh, few months so the thing is we have to keep on adding changing adding deleting these things are very common in addition to providing playing and engagement instruments we also provide foods in different forms like honey bee these honey to the uh, our himalayan black bear and other bears in different locations so they are engaged in searching them fruits to the birds and likewise next please so these are few other examples ki how we use ice cubes to freeze the smaller fruit item and then we give it to the bear and they are engaged in that so they are searching it they are trying to find it out and they are not simply getting it to eat next one please okay so what new initiatives we have taken uh, number one animal welfare have been our uh, one of the priorities and uh, we have uh, acquired few good medical equipments we need more equipments and we are upgrading our hospital also the plans are underway and we are very hopeful that in uh, future very soon we will have a good hospital along with other medical facilities required we are members of waja and we maintain all the medical records and other uh, records of the animals on gyms and we keep on organizing uh, engagements interactions between different uh, other institutions of veterinary importance so that we can share our knowledge and we can learn from the experience of others next one please some activities which we do every day is just like when zoo is opening before that around 6 o'clock every day the cleaning is start the sanitize sanitization and disinfection starts we are 24 hour cctv monitoring where we can watch the visitors as well as the animals so these are the certain things that are done in our routine work next one please so what we are planning for the future actually 
we are planning a walk in aviary most uh, some of the jews they have this but uh, delhi jew is not at present so we are planning to give a different experience to the visitors a walk in aviary a butterfly park is also proposed both these structures we are very hopeful that within finan this financial year we will be able to construct and open for the visitors hospital and i already told you rescue center is also planned we have also initiated and it is uh, under consideration in the ministry that animal adoption scheme should be started few jews they have started where people can contribute for the conservation of the animal they adopt an animal and they provide expenditure for the maintenance of the animal we are also thinking of putting some big screens so that we can continuously display there about the animals their behavioral things so that same can be used for the education like involving zoo volunteers cycling for the zoo visitors a trackless toy train souvenirs of these things are on the way and within financier we are very hopeful ki they will be there next one please okay so in addition to this what we have done especially if we talk about the zoo to we have to especially mention the covid effect so covid led us to introduction of this uh, e ticketing system to avoid the contact so this is a contactless delivery of the services and at present we are providing only e tickets we are not providing physical tickets so we are signing different mous with different institutions so we can have the technical expertise exchange with them animal expertise exchange with them we are also trying to get some good attraction animals like giraffe and zebra with other zoos we are planning a evolutionary park theme also in the zoo where we can have a dinosaur park and sir or mammoth park where uh, kids and visitors can see how the evolution took place in past so likewise so many things are underway and uh, i'm very hopeful ki within a year we will have a totally different zoo having very good facilities for the animal welfare for the visitors and uh, uh, it, it, it will definitely go up that's what it means so that's all from my side thank you very much thank you so much sir for giving a brief overview of the delhi zoo and the infrastructure that is there there so we now move on to question answer session for today's talk we will take question answers for the first session first so dr sateep can you hear me yes yes i can okay so so the first question for you is that uh, what is the breeding biology of the species like and are they seasonally monogamous yeah so these are uh, polygynous species where uh, uh multiple females mate with uh, uh males a single male and uh, it is generally seen in uh, other bustard species that about uh, uh a few of the males they sire majority of the offsprings in the uh, in the population so it's uh, basically a uh, exploded what it is called an exploded leg polygynous species uh polygynous meaning that uh, one male mates with multiple females and the exploded leg refers to the particular uh, system uh, mating system in which a few uh, in which the males basically station themselves a little apart from each other about 500000 meters apart from each other and they perform these courtship rituals and the females uh, uh, they yeah I, okay can you yeah. Yes. Yes, right. yes, yes, yes. Yes. So okay. So, sir, the next question for you is that uh, what were the challenges faced in establishing the XC two husbandry protocols when you first started this? Uh, started right. the XC two breeding. Yes. So, uh, conservation breeding is uh, uh, is very challenging, and it is uh, it is particularly challenging for species such as bustards, which have a very complex uh, breeding biology, uh, and they are not known to be easy birds to be kept in captivity and all. and however there have been a few uh, success stories with them hubara uh, australian bustard uh, kori bustard all of these and even great bustards all of these close related species have been kept in rare and bred in captivity so we had some templates to begin with and we used those template uh, has been reapproaches uh, to uh, 
can you hear me Arundhati? yes i think we lost you after you said we had those templates yes yes okay. sorry so we have a few uh, templates from the other species that we started with uh, in deciding what to feed them when to uh, you know uh, uh, what and when to feed them Gradually, we basically uh, we refined from those templates, looking at the responses of our uh, words and learning from them, and uh, and uh, sort of uh, developed our are developing our own approach based on those templates. Right, sir. And so the next question for you is that the buster distribution range has shrunk drastically. So would it be advised to have more more than one such center that has been established right now in Rajasthan, so that all the eggs are not in one basket? Yeah, very important question. It's uh, it has uh, both yes and no. Uh, the thing is that the other uh, areas in the range states do not have population that can support uh, uh, collection of eggs. Uh, you know, to create a captive population, we require at least twenty to twenty five founders to make them demographically and genetically, uh, you know, uh, stable um, and secure from uh, from uh, you know stochastic events. Uh, now. The other populations such as Kutch, Karnataka, Maharashtra, they have already lost, uh, uh, many of them have lost their males and they are not uh, in a breeding potential. Uh, the only population that uh, can support a collection is Rajasthan and therefore we had facilities in Rajasthan and we uh, have two facilities so that all the eggs are not in the same basket, one in some and another in Ramdevara, which are separated by about 150 kilometers. Uh, so actually the eggs are not in the same basket. Uh, and uh, probably if uh, once the captive breeding is successful and we are rewilding the birds, at that time we will, uh, as a national effort, uh, there will be efforts to go to different range states and have release uh, centers. But uh, it is not pragmatic to have founder uh, uh, centers or captive breeding centers in different uh, states. Uh, Right, sir. And the next question for you is that how does the Great Indian Buster program intend to institute institutionalize the knowledge required in breeding and keeping the species at the local level? Right. So we have a continued documentation uh, of uh, of the approach and uh, the various learnings that we have. And uh, this is a uh, this is a program which is a joint effort of the Ministry of Environment, Forest, Climate Change, Rajasthan Forest Department, and Wildlife Minister of India. And everything is documented, and therefore they can be uh, they are very much uh, uh, you know uh, they can be very much institutionalized. Um, also, uh, these will help into developing uh, husbandry approaches in general uh, in consultation with CZA, of course, and they then that way they can also be uh, helpful in uh, uh, sort of. Uh, for other uh, local species that you are talking about. Right. And so the last question for you is that has there been any consultation to consider working with zoos within the rain states to create any educational outreach campaign for the species? Um, well, I mean, uh, not uh, okay. So we are uh, in a sort of uh, uh, communication with the Machia Biological Park in uh, Rajasthan, but uh, there are not, um, uh, actually there is no zoo in the country that currently has Great Indian Bustard. Um, uh, and uh, Machia Biological Park has a few uh, in Jodhpur, uh, has a few uh, Hubaras. Uh, but uh, yes, that is something, uh, particularly for the outreach program, although without having the exhibit, it will be uh, in, in this particular case uh, that we can definitely think of. Right, sir. So those were the questions for you. We uh, now move on to questions for uh, Mr. Dharamdeus. Sir, are you there with us? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, okay. So, sir, the uh, first question for you is that as the national zoo of the country, what is the vision for, for the zoo in the next five years, if there's anything that's envisioned as such? Uh, we, under the guidance of ministry, there is a vision that we have to make certain world-class zoos. So National Geological Park is one of them. And as I told you, zoos, they not only provide about the sighting of the animals, they create awareness and they make an ideal spot for different activities related to nature and nature conservation. So on that platform, making the world-class zoo, we are working. 
and uh, i'm hopeful ki within 5 years we will be able to make the national geological park in part plus so that is all all right sir and uh, so moving on to the second question the second question is that how has the national geological park uh, propagated the idea of displaying animals in nature immersing enclosures mm -hmm. and how have you integrated the existing landscape with the during this process is there something you can say on that uh, i i think all the credit goes to the founders of zoo when in the 60s actually 1960s when the zoo was open actually before that i we can easily guess 10 years of work at least so that was the you know in asia it was the first zoo having these kind of uh, you know things where there is no barrier there are nothing uh, cage like structure and directly you are watching the animal so the entire credit goes to our founders and that tradition has been maintained afterwards also we uh, we didn't go into a different mode or uh, other things so that such a good work was done and the same was carried up. Right, sir. And so the next question for you is that there are several free-ranging animals within the premises and migratory birds that visit every year. Are there any monitoring or research uh, activities done for these species that visit? Okay. So first coming to the migratory birds, since Delhi Zoo is having natural ponds actually, these ponds, they, they work as a, you know, good habitat for the migratory birds. And few birds, they, water birds, they live there permanently throughout the year also. So especially after spread of avian influenza, so we have become cautious and we keep close watch over the age, uh, migratory birds and otherwise also over the health and behavior of the birds. Number two, we do counting of these migratory birds so that we are able to know if there is an increase or decrease in their number. Number three, coming to the free-ranging animals, so we have a variety of animals in zoo because I already told that there is very good visitation and no disturbance, we can say, almost no disturbance because the entire area is fenced by a boundary wall. So what we are doing this year, we are going to, because in Delhi Zoo, if you come, peacock is a very good attraction. You get so many peacocks, in, even in the tiger and lion enclosure also you get peacocks. So what we are doing, we are going to do enumeration of different species. So what are our free-ranging animals? Already we have a list, but we will just do the enumeration. What are the numbers, probable numbers? Right, sir. And moving on to the next, so the last question for you, it is that what are the, uh, are there any research activities or educational activities carried out by the zoo? And if you can just highlight on what is the, what is the status thereof on it? Uh, at present, we are pl at planning phase for the new these, uh, research where we will be including our uh, target animals, which uh, we are the coordinating zoo for the breeding purpose. But otherwise, we already the research that we have done, one of the major research of them is, which is underway, is knowing the level of stress in the animals in zoo. So where we have developed a methodology and by using the fecal samples, level of stress hormones are being uh, analyzed. And after doing few more uh, round of sampling, depending upon different seasons and other variations so that everything is counted in, so we will be able to give, you know, a baseline sort of thing. Otherwise, also in different animals, behavioral studies are done, like in birds and deer. And we have a list of uh, publication of different studies. Also. Similarly, we did a study over the enrichment also. What enrichment has been done in the different enclosures? And is there any significant change in the behavior of animal? So we have that uh, data and publication also. Right. Thank you so much, sir. So those were the questions for you. And with that, we come to the conclusion of our 75th Know Your Species, Know Your Zoo talk. 
On behalf of the Sentence Authority, I would like to thank both Dr. Sapita Datta and to you, Mr. Dharam Deorai, for taking time out of your busy schedules and joining us for this talk. I would also like to thank the audience who have been with us throughout, and I hope you know more about the GIB as well as the National Zoological Park in New Delhi. And this marks also the end of our 75 week long talk series on Know Your Species, Know Your Zoo. I hope, uh, as audience, you've known more about the 75 conservation priority species that are native to India, as well as the 75 zoos that are spread across the 10 biogeographic zones of our country. And uh, once again, thank you so much for joining us for this final talk. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.